my name is Olivia and welcome or welcome back to my channel. Today's video is going to be some popular books that I did not enjoy and couldn't understand what all of the hype was about. Before I start, I want to give a quick disclaimer. Due to the overwhelming popularity of some of these books, I realize that I am in the minority with my opinion, but it is just that, an opinion. Everyone is entitled to their own thoughts and opinions while they're reading. Just because I didn't like some of these, that doesn't mean that you can't enjoy them. With that being said, let's get into the video. I have a total of nine books that I wanted to talk about today, and I don't have the physical editions for most of these because I either got them out of the library or have since unhauled them. The first book that I wanted to talk about is Crazy Rich Asians by Kevin Kwan. The book follows American-born Chinese professor Rachel Chu as she travels to Singapore where she vacations with her boyfriend, Nicholas Young. Meeting his parents, relatives, and friends comes as quite a shock to her when she realizes that he was born into one of the wealthiest families in Singapore. She's incredibly out of her element among his socialite relatives and friends, and readers have an opportunity to immerse themselves in her awe and amazement as she begins to experience this world of luxury, name brands, and extravagant parties. I will preface this one by admitting that I did watch the film prior to reading the book, and I think this likely had a negative impact on my thoughts on the book. I couldn't help constantly comparing the two while I was reading, and the book seemed to lack some of the flair and novelty that initially attracted me to the film. Based upon the movie, I went to this book expecting a compelling plot that gave some insights into the luxurious lifestyle of some of Asia's elites. Instead of a substantial plot, this book was filled with over-the-top descriptions of excessive wealth and materialism, and I could have done without. To be frank, I could have cared less about most of these descriptions. I didn't recognize 99.9% .9 of the luxury name brands and influential figures that were referenced, and I never really cared to immerse myself in that world. Consequently, I spent most of this book feeling lost, disengaged, and disillusioned with the lifestyles and the characters that were being put on display. I don't support many of the themes that were prevalent in this book, and that resulted in my reading experience being nothing short of frustrating. I ended up putting this book aside about three quarters of the way through it, and I have no intentions of picking it back up or returning to any of the other books in the series. I could talk about Crazy Rich Asians for hours, mentioning some of the things that I wasn't a huge fan of while reading, so let me know in the comments down below if you'd be interested in a full review. The next book that I wanted to mention is Codename Verity by Elizabeth Wine. This novel revolves around two female protagonists and unexpected best friends, a pilot and a special operations executive, and it's set against the backdrop of World War II. A failed mission causes one of these women to be captured by the Gestapo, rendering her a prisoner of war. The narrative is told from her perspective in a series of flashbacks as she recounts and records these memories during the war for her captors. World War II is one of my favorite periods to read about, so I was ecstatic when I heard that this historical fiction was being released. From the immediate outset of this book, I was a little bit wary about the unconventional lens through which the story was being told. The way in which events are discussed is incredibly disorienting, and it's often non-chronological, which leads to even more confusion. The narration tended to jump around from plot point to plot point, not necessarily in order, and it seemingly had no purpose. This turned out to be off-putting and difficult to follow, and while I initially chalked this up to being a technique that the author was employing, I never really figured out what she was trying to achieve, and this continued for the entire duration of the book. This type of storytelling also left me with a host of unanswered questions for the majority of the narrative, up until the very end. Despite many of these topics being addressed within the final 20 or 30 pages of the book, I would have liked their resolutions to be a little bit more scattered throughout and introduced before the very conclusion. I didn't enjoy the feeling of being strung along and constantly kept in the dark for the entirety of the book, hence why I was looking for a few answers a little bit sooner than we received them. To make matters even worse, I wasn't satisfied with most of these resolutions and with the way a few of the plot points were tied up within this first book. The story is told from two different perspectives, and it routinely flip-flops back and forth. But the narration was so similar, and there was so much overlap in the characters' voices, that I could not tell their portions apart. This made the characters feel interchangeable and nondescript. All in all, this one was a huge disappointment, and it certainly fell short of the hype for me. I definitely will not be continuing on with this series. 
The next book on my list is Hidden Figures by Margot Lee Shetterly. This is a nonfiction that depicts the lives and contributions of the female African American computers or mathematicians working at NASA. These computers were responsible for many of the calculations that led NASA into its golden age, and the book details many of the ups and downs that these women experienced along the way. This is yet another work that I picked up only after watching the film adaptation, and I think the movie artificially heightened and inflated my expectations for this book. Despite its characterization as a nonfiction, I was expecting this book to revolve around the same cast of main characters that were introduced to in the movie, and I was expecting it to be more plot-driven. Instead, it began by explicitly detailing the history and some of the facts and figures about the female computers working at NASA, and it introduced a much wider cast of characters, instead of focusing on a select few individuals. While I appreciated these historical insights and the very obvious in-depth research that the author conducted, the plot came across as convoluted and watered down due to the inclusion of the sheer volume of facts and some extraneous details that it didn't appear that readers needed to know. It led to an experience that felt more like sitting down to read a history textbook than reading an intriguing tale for my own personal enjoyment. The book was also highly repetitive, and it kept regurgitating some of the same facts and concepts that we had already heard earlier on in the story. As a result, I ended up DNFing this book at 64%, and I have no plans to return to it. The next book is the first installment in the trilogy, and it's End I Darken by Kirsten White. The protagonist, Lada, serves as a female portrayal of Vlad the Impaler, which I thought was a very unique twist on a classic story. Much of the book depicts her early years, up until she becomes a teenager, as she's abandoned by her father and sent to live within the Ottoman Empire. The point of view switches back and forth between that of Lada and her younger brother Radu, who provides a stark contrast to many of Lada's personality traits and characteristics. The pacing was my primary complaint for this book. It was painfully slow, and I was repeatedly losing focus while reading. The plot consisted of a few exciting and rather major developments, interspersed among a tedious and monotonous sea of extraneous information that never seemed to amount to anything. Due to this artistic choice, I have a feeling that this first book is going to be used to set up some of the major plot points and events in later installments in the series. Despite recognizing that some of these slower portions of the novel may have some ulterior purpose that isn't immediately apparent, I should be able to enjoy the first book in a trilogy as its own contained book, and I shouldn't have to continue reading in order to fall in love with the series. With respect to the characters, I had some major issues with the portrayal of Lada, especially since she was branded and advertised as a kick-ass female heroine who was supposed to represent Black the Impaler. In this first book, we're constantly told how brutal, ruthless, and bloodthirsty she is, but there's never any information to back these claims up. These statements grew less and less believable as I progressed through the book and wasn't able to find any evidence of her cunning and conniving characteristics. This was a blaringly obvious instance of the author telling and not showing. I can't comment as to whether this is something that's rectified in later books in the series, but it's something that caught my attention in a negative light in this first installment. With that being said, Kirsten White's writing is phenomenal, and I appreciated how she utilized this to her advantage, crafting a very grim and gruesome mood in order to tell this tale. One of the only other aspects within this book that I enjoyed were some of the historical components. I learned quite a bit of new information about the Ottoman Empire, and the novel prompted me to go and research some of the individuals and events that were referenced. I've put this series on hold for the past several years in order to distance myself a bit from the not-so-pleasant reading experience that was And I Darken. I've heard that the later books in the trilogy improved substantially with respect to the pacing and the characters, so I haven't written it off altogether. I may decide to give this first book a reread at some point in the future, with the plans to continue on with the rest of the series, but I'm not making any promises. The next book that I wanted to talk about is The Selection by Kira Cass. The book details The Selection, a dating experience with a competitive slant with the goal of identifying a future wife for the prince. 35 girls compete for the prince's heart, and one of these contestants, America Singer, is the main focus of this novel. And believe it or not, she is a singer. The protagonist's name and its unoriginality were some of the first red flags that I stumbled across in this book, 
and I wish I had paid closer attention to these warning signs when I was first starting out. This series reminded me of a poorly executed rendition of The Bachelor set against more of a medieval dystopian backdrop. Throw in a little unnecessary and uninteresting political turmoil and you have the selection series. Needless to say, I was not amused or entertained. It's difficult to adapt reality TV shows into compelling, interesting, and original books. And I don't think it has the same appeal or effect when it's recorded in a written context. These books are also riddled with tropes, which certainly doesn't help their cause. The insta-romances and consistent love triangles were enough to immediately shut down any remaining interest that I had in this series. Add in the catty and petty attention-seeking behavior of 35 girls hoping to convince a member of royalty to fall in love with them, and the series quickly turned into a catastrophic train wreck. Don't ask me why, but I've read the first four books in the series in their entirety. I think I was expecting the series to redeem itself in some of the later books, and then I got stuck in a continual trap of repeatedly picking up the next book. Regardless, I think it's safe to say that I've given this series plenty of opportunities to wow me and win me over, and it's miserably failed to do so each and every time. Despite my probably too optimistic line of thinking, the later installments were equally as unimpressive and non-memorable as the first book, so I wish I had just stopped there. I honestly couldn't tell you any of the events or plot points that occurred in later books in the series, so that definitely tells you something about the quality of the writing and the plot. I realize that there's only one more installment of this five book series that I've yet to read, but I can guarantee that I plan to stay as far away from it as possible. Picking up this final book would likely require me to reread the earlier books in the series to refresh my memory as to who the characters are and what happens, and I have no desire to submit myself to something like that. Next up is Harry Potter and the Cursed Child by John Tiffany, Jack Thorne, and J.K. Rowling. This is actually a script for a play that's intended to serve as the eighth installment in the Harry Potter series. It picks up after the epilogue of Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows, and it centers on many of the children of the main characters that we follow throughout the first seven books in the series. There are quite a few familiar faces along the way, even though Harry, Ron, and Hermione take a bit of a backseat in this one. This play was controversial pretty much immediately after its release, and it's proven fairly divisive even among the most dedicated of Harry Potter fans. I loved the original seven book series when I was growing up, and they were some of the first larger books that I tackled as a child. I was somewhat excited, but primarily apprehensive when the news of this book was initially released. I actually contemplated never picking it up because I was satisfied and content with the ending that Rowling had written in Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows. Ultimately, I gave in on account of sheer curiosity and I ended up picking up the script. It was an overwhelmingly disappointing letdown, to say the least, especially for a series that I had adored when I was growing up. The play read like a poorly written fan fiction, and it took significant liberties with respect to the portrayal of some of the characters, and it even deviated significantly from Rowling's writing style. Many of the characters were utterly unrecognizable, which was one of the most devastating components of this book. I had been looking forward to returning to the familiar cast of characters that I had grown up alongside. Instead, their speech and actions were far from characteristic of their personalities and traits that we were introduced to in earlier books. The world building, or lack thereof, was equally disappointing. I'll admit that this could be a byproduct of merely reading the script instead of watching it in its intended medium on the stage. Nevertheless, I had been hoping to re-immerse myself in Rowling's imaginative genius when it came to the magical world, but this play was completely devoid of that spark that had initially drawn me into this series. All in all, I wish I hadn't picked this one up, even if it received J.K. Rowling's stamp of approval. I was perfectly content with her original summation and conclusion to the series, and I wish I had just left it at that. If you haven't read this one, I 100% would not recommend it. It is not worth it. The next book that I wanted to talk about is probably going to be a fairly controversial one, and it's the Lord of the Rings series by J.R.R. Tolkien. I have a feeling that this one needs no introduction due to the sheer popularity of the books and the film franchise. As a fantasy lover, it feels wrong to not stand by or support one of the classic fantasy novels that kicked off the genre in the mid-1900s. 
However, I've given this series ample opportunities to stun me and draw me into the world, and it's failed to do so each and every time that I've tried to pick it up. I've tried reading the first book in the series, The Fellowship of the Rings, four times now, and I've ended up DNFing it each time. I found the storytelling to be excessively descriptive, to the point of being overwhelming and downright painful. I recognize that this is a product of Tolkien's very lyrical writing style, but it didn't suit my personal tastes, and I didn't find that it added much to the story. The descriptive, flowery writing seemed to hold back the pacing of the book, particularly during scenes that I believe were intended to be fast-paced and action-packed. The descriptions really slowed down my reading, particularly when it came to these high-intensity scenes, and that caused me to quickly lose interest in what was intended to be one of the focal points of the book. The plot itself stood out to me as rambling and circuitous, and it felt like the characters were stuck in some permanent traveling limbo in which they never reached their final destination. To be fair though, I may not have read far enough into the book in order to witness the characters reaching a setting that was exponentially more interesting than just trekking through the wilderness. I made it halfway through the book on several of my attempts to finish it, and I feel like that should have been enough time to reach a more interesting environment and point in the book. It definitely shouldn't take more than half of the novel to draw me into the story, and that was one of my major complaints. Interestingly enough, I did read and enjoy Tolkien's The Hobbit. While I found the descriptions within The Hobbit to be equally excessive, they were at least interspersed within a much more interesting and complex narrative structure. I also preferred the pacing within The Hobbit. It was much, much faster, and it drew me in much more quickly. Another aspect of this book that I particularly enjoyed was the immediate introduction of a sense of intrigue and mystery which was another factor that helped to immediately draw me into the story and pique my curiosity. This air of uncertainty was definitely lacking in The Fellowship of the Rings, and I think that was the reason why I wasn't particularly invested in the story or the characters. The Lord of the Rings is yet another series that I haven't written off entirely, but I'm reluctant to return to it and give it a second chance. Perhaps I'll pick it up again in a few more years after my most recent experience with The Fellowship of the Rings has faded a bit. The final two books that I wanted to mention are Pride and Prejudice and Sense and Sensibility by Jane Austen. These seem to be classics that everyone has picked up at one point or another, usually for some type of coursework, and they seem to be overwhelmingly positively received. On the other hand, I read these both for high school English classes, and I found them far from enjoyable. I'm sure some of this stemmed from reading them within the context of a course. I had to fly through these in a fairly abbreviated time period, and then I proceeded to do assignments and write some essays on them. But setting aside the academic nature to my approach to these books, I found that the writing, the plot, and the characters all left a little something to be desired. The plot moved at a downright glacial pace for both of these books. I'm sure that this was a more traditional plot structure for books that were being published in this time period, but I was bored to tears. If all of the extraneous details and scenes in these books had been removed, they easily could have been whittled down to under 200 pages. These characters also appeared very shallow, and Austin seemed to sacrifice character depth and character development in order to make some social commentaries. While I appreciated her insertion of some of her own thoughts and beliefs within her works, I would have enjoyed it more if she had done it in tandem with some three-dimensional characters and some character arcs. Overall, if something like these was published today, I'm not sure that it would receive the same publicity and critical acclaim that Austen's works have. While my impressions of these books were less than stellar, I haven't completely written off picking up Pride and Prejudice and Zombies. I have a feeling that Zombies may be able to spice things up a bit, and I think that might be exactly what these books needed. And that wraps up some of the popular books that I didn't enjoy and didn't understand where exactly all of the hype was coming from. I hope you enjoyed this video, and feel free to leave a comment down below mentioning some of the popular books that you weren't particularly fond of. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in my next video.